Welcome to The Real News. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. And I'm Paul Jay, and I'm also in Baltimore. And welcome to our first ever webathon in our new Baltimore studio. We have an amazing lineup today. We'll be interviewing <laughs> some of your favorite Real News guests, and you'll have a chance to get your questions answered by them. So feel free to tweet us at The Real News or send us an email. We're also going to have live musical performances, as well as spoken word poets performing. And Paul, we're also trying to raise some money, right? Yeah, we're trying to raise some money. And the fact that we're coming from this new Real News Media Center kind of gives the impression like we have a lot of money, but we don't. We have one very generous donor, Kitty Plus Foundation, that helped build the building and do all the construction, but that doesn't actually change our operating budget. Our operating budget's about a million, just over a million dollars a year, which if you look at the 990s of some of the other independent news organizations, you'll see it's a fraction of what many of them are operating at. We think we do quite a bit with very little. But we need to do way more to take advantage of this incredible opportunity of having this big studio that can seat 125 people, which we'll show you later. For town hall events, we want to do investigative journalism. We want to strengthen our international coverage, our national coverage. But most importantly, we want to do something new for the real news. And I think it's perhaps new for certainly broadcast independent media. We're going to take on local television news. We want to become mainstream news in city after city in the United States, in Canada, and even other parts of the world, because we think that's where me mainstream media is very weak. If you look at local news here in Baltimore, it's rather atrocious. Uh, take a look at who does the news in Baltimore. Baltimore City is 64% black of 650,000 people. If you look at who's doing the news, it's three to one white on-air personalities. Why? Because Baltimore County is 64% white. So what does that mean? It means that news who's based on advertising model, and if you sell ads, who are you interested in? Well, you're first you're interested in the majority, and if you put the city and the county together, it's mostly white people. But you're also interested in people that have more disposable income. So you don't care all that much about inner city problems of Baltimore, except how it affects the sensibility of white people. So we are going to try to change that model here in Baltimore and in other cities. And we're going to do investigative journalism. We're going to do town hall debates with one question in mind. If you ran the city and you ran the state in the interest of the majority of its people, what does that public policy look like? Well, to do that means investigative journalism. It means more producers. It means more staff. In fact, we're pulling off this live broadcast today with about half what a professional, <coughs> fully funded studio would have. And I have no doubt that will show itself over the course of the day. But we trust you'll be patient with us. At any rate, we need you to donate. We have, we have a matching grant of $75,000. We're trying to raise a total of $150,000. We're only about a little over halfway there. And that's why we're doing the webathon today. So you can phone in, and uh, the phone number is 1 252 8006. And uh, now I have it in front of the camera, so I don't have to look here. 1 252 8006. Uh, you can also go to the website, which is the easiest way to donate. Just go to realnews.com and click on donate, and everything will be there. You can also, if you want to get in touch with us, and this is a live event, so what we're really hoping is you're going to send in questions and comments, and we're going to read them on air uh, as they come in, more or less. Uh, Twitter us at, uh, at, where are we? We're at, at The Real News. Yeah, we, you could tweet us at tweet The Real us. News. Twitter us, yeah, yes. Tweet, it's, just tweet. Okay, I'm old. <laughs> tweet us at, at The Real News. And uh, th throughout the day, we will let you know uh, other ways to get hold of us. We're on Facebook. Uh, you can find us at Facebook, at the Re Facebook Real News, Facebook.com Facebook 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 oh. slash The Real, Real News. News. Uh, but most importantly, don't forget about the donate button. So very quickly, we're going to go from now till about 3.30 with several panels, and we'll tell you more about what they are. We're going to take a break. We come back again at 8 o'clock, and we go to about 11.30 at night. But around 10, 30, 11, we're really going to open it up for viewer participation, where you can phone in your comments and talk with us, and we'll talk about real news questions and, and all of that. Now, without further ado, I turn it back to Jessica to introduce our first panel of the day. Yeah, we have our first panel joining us in studio. We have Bill Binney here. Bill Binney is a <coughs> former high place intelligence official with the National Security Agency turned whistleblower. He retired <coughs> after more than 30 years with the agency. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. And Kirk Wiebe. <coughs> Kirk Wiebe is a former NSA senior intelligence analyst and an NSA whistleblower who worked with NSA for more than 32 years. Thank you both for being with us. Good to be with you. 
Uh, Bill, kick us off. Uh, for viewers that aren't that familiar with the story, in particular your story, uh, what, what drove you to blow the whistle? You had to put your, your career on the line, perhaps your neck. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, I guess uh, <clears throat> the first thing uh, that, that I saw that was a problem at NSA was the corruption in, in the contracting and, and spending of billions of dollars. So that, 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 was, uh, that was leading me to uh, want to get out of there, to, to complain to the Department of Defense Inspector General, which we eventually did. Uh, and then in October of 2001, they started spying on everybody in the United States, and that was really unconstitutional violation of the First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendments at a minimum of the Constitution, not counting any number of laws and rules governing, FCC rules governing telecommunications companies and all that. So it was all the illegality and, and criminal activity on top of the corruption that, that made it important for me to get out. So that's why I got out. And then we, Kirk and I and others kept trying to work within the government for another six or seven years to try to get the government to change its ways, you know, to correct, right itself and do the right thing. And you say uh, work within the government, so you're talking to your supervisors, things well, like that? Well, we were talking to the House and Senate Judiciary and Intelligence Committees mm -hmm. and also the uh, Inspector Generals of the Department of Justice and the Department of Defense and other, other members of Congress. What years are we talking about here? Uh, basically from 2001 through 2007. Uh, and then in 2007, I guess we were causing too much of a stir in Congress, so they sent the FBI to raid us and basically intimidate us and keep us quiet. That was their that, function. That worked really well. Yeah, right. Well, <laughs> what happened after that is we lawyered up and the lawyers told us, well, keep quiet. Don't say anything. Don't talk to anybody. Uh, so we did for a short period. And then we said, this doesn't make any sense. You know? So then we, when we went back at, after Obama was elected, we went back to talk to the uh, inspector general at the D Department of Justice. Uh, hoping that they would realize the unconstitutional activity and uh, criminal activity. When you say we, this is with Kirk. Kirk and I. Well, let me ask Kirk yep. the same question. So th there's a moment where you decide to, you know, to essentially become a whistleblower. Uh, so what, what, dro what drove you? Uh, the thing that drove me were, were, were twofold. The first being the wasting of billions of dollars when yep. uh, director of NSA Hayden began something called Trailblazer, which four years later was declared a complete failure. Um, we saw industry in partnership with the government marching down the wrong road, yep. and we knew it. <coughs> Tra Trailblazer, if I remember correctly, this is this like essentially full spectrum information gathering. We will have everything from everybody all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely, everything. Saturated <coughs> surveillance, if you will. And, and so why did you stick your neck out? I mean, most of the people you were working with did not stick their neck out. No, we, we have, unfortunately, yeah. um, we have a society that is too willing to um, go along to get along. What I mean is we have people seeing things that are wrong but unwilling to take action about those things. Uh, probably because of self-interest, career, family, money, paycheck, all of the reasons we can, we can associate with. But what is it that causes someone to go that extra step and, and putting their own life on the, or their own reputation? on the chopping block, if you will. And I think it really comes from how one is raised. Um, if you're yep. raised <coughs> with an ethic that says wrong is wrong <coughs> and it's not okay to tolerate it, mm. then you um, take that extra step. Well, the, if the culture right now, especially if you look at the main sectors of the economy, particularly banking, is certainly telling us ethics don't mean a damn thing. Right. <laughs> exactly right. Uh, <coughs> ethics is the single biggest problem we have in our society. And I see many groups studying why government doesn't work. But I can tell you it isn't why government doesn't work, mm -hmm. it's why society is not working. The fabric of what used to be America, a fairly common set of beliefs, has yep. been shredded, <coughs> torn apart by concept of self. What am I going to get out of this? What are me and my friends going to get out of this? even what is my race going to get out of this. Unless you're a soldier, in which case then you should go die for the rest of us. Exactly yeah, right. right. Jess? Oh, uh, well, Kirk, you were on the program not too long ago, and we were talking about Edward Snowden. Absolutely. And um, his interview with NBC, Brian Williams, but NBC failed to actually air a portion of that interview where he discussed how NSA had intel about 9-11 before it happened. How do we know all this? 
Well, it's, it really comes uh, from Snowden, and it really comes from um, Thomas Drake, a right. colleague and fellow whistleblower, both Bill's and right. mine. Um, if, to, just so people understand, Bill and I and Ed Loomis retired from NSA about six weeks after the events of 9-11. We did so in disgust. The NSA had failed. The fact that 9-11 happened is an ad hoc admission of failure by NSA. We weren't supposed to have any more Pearl Harbors. Uh, but we did. Uh, so we left uh, in disgust because Trailblazer was the name of the game and we <coughs> knew that was going to fail. And so we thought we would bring our ideas into government through another door, maybe at CIA, maybe on some other contract. Um, but, but the thing I'm talking about here is Snowden reveals uh, and talks about the fact that NSA knew about 9-11. Here's the how they knew. There was data in the databases that no one saw, mm. but later showed up when Drake was part of a commission, the Saxby Chambliss Commission, that looked into the events of 9-11 and why they happened. And they found this information in NSA's databases. But the shocking thing is, they also knew they had the information, different information, but the same information, basically, uh, but didn't report it didn't tell anybody about it. That's the <laughs> shocker. And there's several examples in other pieces of the intelligence apparatus that had very hard information yes. and it doesn't <coughs> get passed That's on. Exactly right. right. And it's an anathema to, to figure out why someone would not inform people who needed to know. I don't know if you saw the interview I did with Senator Bob Graham who uh, co-chaired the uh, joint uh, congressional investigation into 9-11. And uh, first of all, they made direct connection in their investigation with the role of the Saudi government and Saudi officials in helping finance and uh, help yeah. organize, <coughs> yeah. give actual support. But there's various examples they, exa they uh, investigated where there was information that if it had been followed up, if it had been filtered up, uh, perhaps 9-11 would have been prevented. And I asked them, you know, you start to wonder if there actually isn't some kind of systemic thing in the culture that, like, we don't want to know. Like, why do you, why do you uh, fire uh, your, your terrorism czar or, or demote the terrorism czar? I mean, there's a pattern here of there something, is, is there, there not? There is a pattern. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, take for example what, what Kirk was talking about, where all the phone calls from San Diego back to the Yemen facility. All, all that data was known by, by the way, both sides were known. I mean, that's how caller ID works, okay? These are machines and switches. They're, they're automatic switches that route the material through. So it has to have the ma material, the phone numbers at both ends to route it to make it successfully connect. So all that information was all there all the time. It's just that uh, people had it in the base and they were depending on people to go through these bases to find that material. Well, you see, that was what our program was all about, was to automate that entire process so that people wouldn't, wouldn't need to look into the databases. The data would be pulled out and shoved at them and also we would make other things like report it to the FBI or other, other, any other agency that needed to but know that. But your program was too cheap. Yeah, it was too cheap. That's yeah, right. you have to spend <clears> a lot of money because there's a lot of contractors <laughs> depending on that. For there, there, was another, there was another aspect too. The automation uh, was a, th people perceived that to be a threat to their job. Because if you automated the process, people didn't have to do it, okay? So they, meant, they figured that that was a threat to their job. Listen, listen last Thursday a bill passed uh, the Senate, I believe. In the House. In the yeah. House. Yeah. The House bill <coughs> uh, with a, a reform bill, the NSA, <coughs> and uh, one of the Republican uh, congressmen who says this bill is good says they're watching us, but now we can watch them. So has anything changed as a result of this, this, this bill? I don't see anything, no. I don't. I mean, I, I, I thought there were two main things they had to do, and they aren't doing either of them. One was to do a focused attack on targets of interest, not, not do this bulk acquisition of everybody in the world, and the other thing was to have a, a checks and a, a system, a way to verify whatever NSA, CIA, or the FBI tells the courts or the Congress to verify what they're saying is really true. Now to do that, you needed a technical group that would go into each agency, uh, uh, anywhere in the agencies, have all the clearances, and they could do this. Okay, that's not so, this is not impossible. And this group would be working for the entire Congress and the entire third rail of government, the courts. not not the FISA court, which is an Article II court. I mean, we're talking Article III courts. So that whenever they tell us something, they would go into these agencies and check 
go into their systems, look at all their databases, look at all the programs, look and see what they're doing and verify what they're saying is true. And then come back and report that as, but as none fact. Of that, none, none of that's That's like trust but verify. The verify part mm. is not there. I mean, the courts are doing, I mean, the FISA court is no oversight. The, the uh, House and Senate intelligence committees have shown they're in bed with the agencies. They're not, they're not overseeing them. They were created back after the church committees in the 70s to monitor the agencies to ensure they didn't spy on Americans. Here they are advocating domestic intelligence on everybody. Yes, and what's happening with the FBI, the parallel construction? I know we talked about this right. a little bit, Kirk, in our interview. Can you describe that some more? Yeah, well, uh, Reuters reported uh, an article back in August of last year in which it gave an example of this <coughs> parallel construction. Let me describe it for you. The example given uh, involved the Drug Enforcement Agency. And in this case, NSA is providing DEA with information DEA is using it to conduct investigations of people without going through a court to establish probable cause. So they do the investigation and then they have a separate organization specifically assigned to cover up the source of the information. This denies a human being their rights in a court of law under our legal system. So they cover it up, make it look like it was a result of a regular investigation. Yeah, they actually did, I don't know if you watched the TV show, The Good Wife? Yes. They actually did two segments where, this is, where the NSA is in meetings with the FBI <laughs> and giving them the information and they're going over, you have to make sure you can show you found this on your own exactly. and all the rest. It finally comes out. Now, in the, in the Good Wife, it ends because her husband happens to be the governor of Illinois. So he leans on somebody and they stop tapping their phones and so on. But of course, the problem's not solved. The, they're exactly. still handing stuff over to the FBI. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I call that process a, a planned program perjury policy run by the Department of Justice of the United States. Mm. And they're not just limiting inside the United States. These tips are going to foreign counterparts around the world. So they're subverting the entire judicial system all the way around the world. Not now, just us. now is, is any of this all that new? What I, what I mean by that is this, this infrastructure spying is a product of the Cold War. A lot of which we know was was <coughs> hyped. I think now a lot of the I know some of the Ray McGovern and other people that were even doing briefings at the time. Uh, Ray has told me many times they were telling uh, Reagan and telling other people in the White House, you know, th the Soviet Union may be messed up, but they are not the hyped up threat threat that you're being told. Yet everyone profited so much from building this enormous military infrastructure and intelligence infrastructure. I, I guess what I'm asking is, after 9/11, is it just the technology got better? Yeah, I mean, uh, th that's the way I'd put it. I mean, before, nine, before uh, basically about 1998, they didn't have the capacity to do this bulk acquisition of information. After that time, they did. And 9-11 and was like the lever that they used to, to uh, start this bulk acquisition of information on everybody. And they started first with people in the United States because we were the closest to them. I mean, interesting enough, this is what the Stasi used to do in Eastern East yeah, Germany. Right. <clears throat> they just didn't have this highfalutin technology to do it with. But, but it's wrong to state that it's the technology that did it. It makes it sound the technology came along and human beings just said, I can't resist it. Uh, the technology right. also provides <clears throat> the tools to control That's it. That's right, it does. In ways never possible before. Because in order to communicate, you have to have protocols, IP protocols, um, to govern what happens. So you actually have an unprecedented capability to access information, but you also have an unprecedented capability to control what you do with it. Mm. So it doesn't have to be such a doesn't broad sweep. Right, exactly right, that's right. right. Yep. But that goes to intent. Exactly. And that goes back to corruption, morality, integrity, and honesty in your belief system. So, so that's actually kind of my big underlying question. You know, the church committee, uh, was it commission or committee? Church committee. 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 Yeah, church yeah. committee uh, that looked into <coughs> CIA wrongdoings towards the end of the Vietnam War, uh, found terrible things. Uh, if you want to talk about intent, it's not like there was some intent in the good old days. Exactly. The intent of the CIA and the structure then was, was violated law, uh, killed people, helped facilitate drug dealing. I mean, it went on and on. Uh, yes. Attempt and real assassination of foreign leaders. It all broke out. It, it made the headlines. There was all kinds of discussion about it. But doesn't the system 
because of something deeper, find a way just to get on with it again, you know? It, yes. Yeah. Well, for a period of time, yes. I think they stopped it just to let, let the, the time pass and people would forget and then they resurrect it again with rendering and torture. I mean, that's basically what happened. That's fundamentally, they, they resurrected a lot of things they were doing. Uh, and here again, we send John Kiriako to jail for exposing it and let the people who, uh, who were doing the torture give them retroactive immunity. I mean, that's, that's how we're covering up the criminals and sending the people who exposed the crimes to jail. Well, in a little bit, in a few minutes, it's actually, it's uh, Michael Ratner and Larry mm -hmm. Wilkerson are going to join us. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but uh, and, and we're going to continue this conversation. Um, uh, let me just, uh, as this is live, and I'm going to ask my director here, is this something we want to do now? Okay, I, I have to remind you. Uh, do you want to do it? Do you want me to yeah, do it? We, please call in. Uh, we have a hotline. Someone will be there picking up your phone call. The number is 188-252-8006. That's 188-252-8006. We actually are going to have Michael Ratner joining us remotely in a few, but I think it's a good lead-in, Paul, for us to just talk about we always go back to this question whenever we're talking about surveillance, whether or not the United States, as citizens, we can think that we could be a global hegemon and also have privacy. How do, how do you actually strike that balance? Can you have those two things? Well, yeah. uh, you, you know, the, the word balance is really a misnomer. Mm. It, it infers that you have to give up something on this side of the scale in order to get something here. Privacy, give up privacy in order to have security. The truth of the matter is you can have both 100% with today's technologies. Bill and I and others in that small little research organization at NSA figured out how to do that after much trial and error. It wasn't that we're just smarter than everybody else. We were persistent and we knew enough to make key breakthroughs. I'll never forget when the deputy director of NSA came down to see what we had done. He said, my God. You've made tremendous breakthroughs. Why are you being so modest? Then he went absolutely quiet because Hayden told him to be quiet and don't do anything to encourage what we had done because he had another path. That was get in bed with industry, make sure lots <coughs> of dollars trade hands, and he was <coughs> blind to the fact that industry didn't have the answer. Okay, 